Welcome back to Three Lessons from Breakthrough Leaders. I'm Zana Rayabchuk, MD at Breakthrough Global. And I'm Dr. Bart Sale, Breakthrough CEO and founder. We've spent 30 years developing the breakthrough methodology to transform companies who want to reach their highest level. And in this podcast, we'll get to the heart of transformation, meeting leaders and creative talents to share three lessons which we guarantee will help you and your companies to unleash your potential. And Bart and I will take a moment to analyse the key takeaways and opportunities for breakthrough thinking. In today's episode, we'll learn from globally celebrated marine scientist and oceanographer, Dr. Gregory Stone. He's the recipient of every award available for diving, ocean science and conservation. His 12,000 dives give him unparalleled knowledge of the ocean and its life. Greg has served in many senior roles during his career. He published hundreds of scientific and popular articles, four books, documentaries for Discovery and National Geographic, a TED Talk, Davos Lectures, and numerous radio and television appearances. And today, we'll hear these three lessons from Greg. Energy and culture, eat strategy for breakfast. The energy and how people relate, how people trust each other, how they communicate, those kind of qualities are what make companies successful and not necessarily someone with fantastic expertise in this area. Why you need to pay attention. Since the Paris Climate Agreement, we haven't done any of that stuff. It's just not taken seriously. There's a lot of lip service to it. Companies have their ESG requirements, but we're not not doing it. Um, We're not facing this existential threat what we need to do to deal with the reality of climate change. There's kind of a, there's kind of a natural law of politics that if, if the leadership from the top is failing, then you need to have it come from the ground up to change it. Lesson one, team energy for success. Why don't you tell our listeners about how we met, Greg? Yeah, yeah, that's a good story. We even shared the honeymoon suite. We did, we did. <laughs> you told me the secret of your business, which I won't won't reveal over the show here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he told me the secret. Tell us more about the honeymoon suite, please. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a it was a little shack actually on the ocean on stilts, and um, we were on a field trip. And there wasn't much accommodation, so we elected to share. What, one of the most remote places I've ever yeah, been. Yeah, really, it was really remote. It was in Ind- Indonesia. It took you like two days to get there once you got to Indonesia. And it was an eco-resort, and um, everybody, you know, everybody had to share. There was uh, doubled up everywhere. And he, he had offered quite generously to uh, use his skill set to help me with my team. I, I ran a global team on ocean conservation for uh, a big organization called Conservation International. And I had about, a, I had about 200 people that kind of were under my purview globally. And we gathered up half of them there for this session. And Bart offered to uh, do with my group what he does with businesses. So the afternoon came um, for him. And I said, okay, Bart, this is your part. This is your part of the show. Go ahead. I didn't know what he was going to do. And he said, okay. So he stood up with his normal charisma and, and focus. And he said, broke us up into groups. And he started at giving questions to the groups and they had to work it out together. And then uh, another question, they'd work it out, another question. And then at the end, they'd report back to the whole group what their answers were. There were, there were questions like, what was the most important thing that Conservation International has ever done? What is the most important thing Conservation International should do in the future? what is uh, the major drawback or problem in Conservation International? It was those sort of general questions. And we finished the day and, and, and you didn't like tell us anything that day. We just kind of all trickled off to our rooms. And, and I, so I asked you that night, I said, so Bart, how were their answers? Did they, did they get it right? You know, what, what's the story? You know, and he said, their answers? He says, Oh, I don't even remember what their answers were. That's not what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, I was looking for energy. I was looking to see how the energy in the group flowed. And he said, you're in pretty good shape. There's one person, you said. 
to to keep an eye on. <clears throat> and then you explained your theory of organizational uh, function, uh, which I know is much more complex than what I'm about to say because uh, I I don't know it exactly. But you said that um, you know the energy and how people relate, how people trust each other. Um, how they communicate those those kind of qualities are what make companies successful and not necessarily the smartest guy in the room or the uh or the or the expertise uh, someone with fantastic expertise in this area and i learned a lot from that that comment you made i mean i've thought about it a lot since and i've um, applied it in my own work now too uh, i i call them uh, i call it whizzy watts i like I like WYSIWATS. What you see is what you get is what I want with people. <laughs> I don't care if it's bad or if it's good, but I want to know what it is. It's the people that tell you different things at different times. You don't know what who they are that is a big problem. And then there's people that just have uh just have this just tense energy that 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 stops the flow of creativity and stops the flow of conversation and and that's the downfall of a lot of groups. And I had come to the organization fairly recently, so I was still on kind of a honeymoon, if you will, uh, with the organization and the employees. So we were in good shape then. And Bart um, was a, a really a really great uh, aid to me in, in, in managing that. Thank you. Energy is fundamental to the way that we transform organizations and individuals. You need to focus on a clear business outcome and then deliver it by evolving the physical, mental and emotional energy of the people. Yes. All too often, we allow external factors to manage our energy state when really it's up to us. So ask yourself, do you manage your energy or does your energy manage you? Everyone has the ability to raise their energy, even by just 10%. Over the whole organization, the impact of this would be huge. So now imagine the impact if everyone in the world raised their energy by just 1%, just one degree change in relation to tackling climate change. It would be enormous. A critical mass of 7 billion people making a 1% increase would be compounded to 10 billion. This one degree shift is a tiny action from each of us that would change the future of the planet. And now, lesson two. Pay attention. It took us 200,000 years to reach a billion people on this planet. And then it took us 200 years to add 6 billion people more to the planet. So we have fundamentally changed the biological architecture of this planet in a way that you can't go back. Um, so trying to go back and restore vast parts of the ocean to what it was once like not only is it impossible, it's in, it's impractical and makes no sense because so many of those people rely on the ocean for food. And most of those people are in the uh, developing world. Uh, they rely on it for food. They rely on it for uh, products, uh, uh, medicinal products. They rely on it for things to sell the ocean and humans. We have become, we had become completely integrated with the ocean. So we decided that a healthy ocean was defined as one that would supply sustainable benefits to people now and into the future. So what that means is that you could look at a coastline and you could see um, a fishing boat, you could see a hotel, you could see a fish farm, you could see a highway, you could see a whole bunch of things. But as long as all those components were engineered such that they did not degrade the ocean, and better yet, they regenerated the ocean, that's sort of the new phase, is that we have to, whatever we do now has to be a plus, not a negative, then that area could have an extremely high ocean health index score. That was the name of the uh, the metric, and, and Bart named it, actually. We were sitting around thinking about all these uh, ways to describe it, and marine conservationists had gone down the negative road for so many years. We, we were documenting the decline of the ocean in scientific papers. It was like funeral reports. Every paper that came out was just bad. So we said, let's put a positive spin on this thing. And we were playing around with words and Bart said health. And we all said health, that sounds strange. 
<laughs> and then we put Ocean Health Index together, and it worked. It took off, didn't it? Yeah, it really did take off. Yeah, it, no, that was a transformational concept that uh, putting humans in the ecosystem was was transformational. We we had, I would say, roughly a hundred scientists around the world that we had uh, consulted with about this. And 90% of them agreed with that. 10% of them didn't. 10% of them walked away and said, you guys are nuts. Uh, I'm going back to my ivory tower and going to study my leafy sea dragon. And you guys do whatever you want. You know, <laughs> um, they, they, didn't, they didn't understand that uh, things were so serious that we had to come up with metrics and ways of communicating that were effective and that we could affect change with it. And in fact, many countries adopted the Ocean Health Index as their way of measuring their, their national ocean conditions. So Greg, thinking about that, where do you see that there's that gap now in terms of where you were then to where you are now and how things are going? I think that uh, I think we're in really big trouble. Since the Paris Climate Agreement, and I was there, I was a science advisor to a country of Kiribati, we haven't done any of that stuff. You know, there was all this hopefulness that we had this agreement, we had these targets, but we've actually increased our CO2 production into the atmosphere since then. And it's just not taken seriously. There's a lot of lip service to it. Companies have their ESG requirements. I have some questions about that, what those really mean and how effective they really are. But we're, we're, not, we're not doing it. Um, we're not facing this existential threat. I've been especially pondering these things a lot. And I want your listeners to know that it is really bad. It is extremely bad right now. And people have to pay attention. They, they can't just sit back and say, and say, oh, I'm, I'm okay. I feel comfortable. Don't change a thing. I like the way it is right now. We'll go to Bangladesh where I think, I think it's a, a thousand people a day are moving uh, away from flooded areas uh, mm. and go to go to a country where the mean life expectancy is 45 years old. Uh, I mean, you got to you got to open it, open your eyes up and look around and, and see what's happening. Yeah. One important lesson for me in my work with conservation is this idea of the moving baseline. And what that means is that previous generations saw a much richer world, a much richer nature in terms of species, in terms of environment. But each generation sees its own world as the baseline. And because of this, we become blind, really, to the changes that are going on, to the declines that are going on. So I can remember when I was young, there were far more birds around. There were far more insects around. There was far more wildlife around. But will my children and my grandchildren realize that? They'll wake up in a world where there's fewer species, fewer wild places to go to. But they'll see that as normal. And this, for me, is the call to action. And lesson three, deal with the reality of climate change. And what do you think we can do about that, Greg? Because, I mean, we've, we've talked in the past about um, the challenge, and you mentioned it there, you know, stop using the word climate because people are going deaf to it. But people are almost like paralysed with their inability to feel like they can contribute or do anything. Um, so what, 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 do you, what do you see are the things that really should be completely changing right now in order to avoid this total disaster? Uh, I can tell you what has worked in the past in civilization, and, and we can learn from that, I think. Those of us my age and Bart's and a little bit older are still uh, very connected to the events of the 20th century. And um, I'm talking about the Depression, and I'm talking about World War II. And as I grew up, you know, my parents were they were still living in the depression and, and world war two in the 1960s and seventies. They were, that, that was a part of their value system. Values have a way of lagging technology. 
you look at the world through the lens of the values that formed you or were strong or were overwhelming or, or important, and they stay with you for a long time. You know, they were so worried about uh, depression and um, some of the aspects of World War II, whereas the threat of the depression, while still there, there had been a lot of safeguards put into place to make sure that didn't happen again. And uh, World War II, you know, we had NATO. Um, that was pretty much locked down right then and there. Uh, the, the Cold War was was far more of a threat, but that wasn't something that they worried about a lot. They were still in their heads telling me about the food stamps that they had during the Depression. They were still telling me about uh, what they both did in World War II. They were still all on that. And and today, today people's values are stuck in the 1970s and 80s, and they're not applying their values to, to 2020, where technology has changed, our science has changed, and there are things that we can do today uh, to do this. The other thing about World War II is that every day, everybody got up in the morning, and the first thing they said to somebody else was, how's the war going? What can I do? The whole society was focused on it. Famously, uh, Roosevelt um, brought car manufacturers and the steel manufacturers to Washington, D.C. in 1941. And he told them, OK, guys, I need you to make me a thousand tanks a month, 20,000 Jeeps. And he, he gave them a shopping order for war material. And the, the presidents of these companies looked at each other and they said, Mr. President, we can't do that. And he said, well, why not? And they said, well, if we do that, we can't make cars. And he said, oh, you don't get it, do you? You're not going to make cars anymore. You're going you're gonna to make war material because if we don't win this war, it's over. I mean, we needed a point in time and a focus to get everybody aligned. And, uh, and, and the time frame was short enough that everyone got it. We need changes like that. We should be thinking about it every day. I, I don't know how to get people's attention. What about you? What about very young people? What about the children now that are being born? Yeah, what, and being educated. What can we do? Because you know, a lot of our listeners out there, they want to do something. Um, and 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 while we may not get the UN organized enough or governments organized up enough, what can people do? Well, well, there's there's kind of a there's kind of a natural law of politics that if if the leadership from the top is failing, then you need to have it come from the ground up to change it. And uh, the American Revolution is a good example of that. And I would add to that though, but you rise up short of violence. You know, you 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 rise up as strong as you can, but you don't get violent. Um, I think that's what's happening now with the young people. They know there's something wrong. Uh, some of them are, are, are mad about it, like that young lady in Sweden. But the, the other part about this is it's a very complicated issue. This is something that just permeates every part of our society. We need to do a real rethink of everything and not just strive for the most expensive, the most luxurious, the most comfortable uh, way to live. So what can we do? Well, my belief is that we all have to get engaged in this. We already have all the resources we need. We may not just see them, and we may not be using them to the full. We need to become more resourceful. It's very easy to become helpless about this when we hear the messages of how far it's gone, that there's no time left and so on. But actually, all that will do is put us all into a resigned mindset and even a cynical mindset, and we become paralyzed. What we need is we need the magical thinking mindset to create new ideas and new possibilities and new ways of solving this. And we need the heroic action following that so that individuals, groups, and even governments can rise to the challenge and change our trajectory. Because in the future, the planet will survive. 
the oceans will survive. That's not a question. The question is, will humanity survive? That's what we're saving here. And as humanity, we have this incredible power to learn from history. We can view history as a wheel, as a cycle, instead of in a linear pattern. And this gives us a lot of resources so that we don't keep making the same mistakes again and again. Greg, on to the hot seat questions. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So the first one is, what is the most exciting thing you've ever done? Diving in Antarctica. 20 years ago, a big iceberg broke off of the Ross ice shelf, the size of the state of Connecticut. Well, there was enough, there was enough fresh water in that iceberg to supply the United States for five years, including its agricultural needs. That's a lot of water. And I heard about it in June and I was there by January on a private National Geographic expedition. And we dove into and under this iceberg. And it was, it was very exciting. It was very dangerous too. I don't think, I, I don't think I would have done it if I had the brain I have in my head now, but <laughs> at, at, that, at, that, at that age, I did it. And, um, and probably the other one would, would have been, it's all got to do with the ocean with me. So it was, you know, be going down to 18,000 feet in a submarine it was pretty exciting. Wow. Finish this sentence, please. Success is. Success is, I'll put it a different way. People often ask me, who, who are my heroes? Okay. It started out one day, somebody said, oh, Ernest Shackleton must be your hero, right? Because I've spent a lot of time in Antarctica. And I said, Ernest Shackleton, are you kidding? Um, people that sacrifice uh, a large part of their comfort their, or their lives for other people really excite me. Nelson Mandela, I would be humbled to, to hope that, that I could have some kind of an effect like that. I don't know that I am, but that, that's what inspires me. What brings you energy and motivation in your everyday life? It's, it's the anticipation of accomplishing things that I will feel good about after I accomplish them. It's um, pondering things like, uh, what is consciousness? Um, I still think that's one of the most important things that we, we should be talking about. Nobody, nobody knows what it is. But I wake up every day thinking about it, wondering what it is. <laughs> that keeps me going. And Greg, if our listeners want to find out more or get in touch with you or send you a question or anything like that, what's the best way to do that? Is that through social media? Should they contact us and we can pass it on to you? How would that work? I usually tell people to Google Greg Stone Ocean, those three words. Greg Stone Ocean. Got it. And they'll find all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Perfect. And Greg, what, what, what's the name of your podcast? The Sea Has Many Voices. What a beautiful name of a podcast. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Greg, for, uh, for agreeing to oh, this. It's, uh, Bart, I'd do anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for today's three lessons. Do make sure you hit the subscribe button and join us next time for another three lessons from Breakthrough Leaders. And you can reach out to us at Breakthrough Global on LinkedIn or Facebook or via Twitter at Radiant Clarity or on Instagram at Global Breakthrough. And we'd love to hear from you, your feedback and your own leadership stories. We'd also love for you to share this episode on your own social media and review and rate this podcast on your player of choice as we want to spread these transformative lessons as widely as possible. And finally, a huge thanks to our production team, Yulia Sheltisova at Breakthrough Global and Robin Leeburn at Fairly Media. And of course, thank you for listening. See you next time. <laughs>